Hello, this is Real World Audio, and uh, today I'm going to answer Adam's question, and uh, he's uh, he's asking me about the Klipsch RP600M, and today I'm going to go deep into the analysis of this loudspeaker. So I guarantee this video is going to go viral, and if not, YouTube adjust your search parameters because they suck. So for now. Let's just uh, look at uh, Adam's uh, uh, post and uh, he said uh, looking at some higher sensitivity speakers to give the 3.5 watt single ended another try is the Klipsch RP600M really the only go to budget high sensitivity speaker seems like everyone else designs speakers in the 85 to 90 dB per watt range and I'm going to go deep for the answer into this uh, question. And uh, let's see uh, uh, whether the Klipsch RP600M is truly a high sensitivity loudspeaker. And why is it so that everyone is just going for the 85 to 90 dB range? Uh, so let's have a look at the Klipsch uh, loudspeaker. So this is how it looks like. I'm just looking at the uh, crutch field. Uh, just looked it up. Uh, and this is how they look like. They are uh, nice little bookshelf speakers at a crazy good price. And, and let's see what are the details on it. So it has a, a Tectrix horn with a titanium tweeter, a six and a half inch uh, woofer. And the frequency response is rated from 45 hertz to 25 kilohertz within 3 dB. And it says sensitivity 96 dB, impedance 8 ohm compatible. And it has a bus reflex design, so it means that it has a port. And it has a real firing Tactrix port. Now this is uh, something uh, truly uh, unusual. And I um, really welcome its design and... Uh, those of you who have seen my videos, you know how what a huge difference uh, a horn base reflex port gives to a cabinet. And uh, and uh, now I have to tell all of you that I never heard this loudspeaker. I never heard any Klipsch loudspeakers in the past 20 plus years. So what the frag I am doing here talking about this loudspeaker. I'm, I'm talking about this because uh, as an engineer, uh, as, as a loudspeaker builder who has a lot of experience with loudspeakers, I understand the physics of how they work so I can give comments to, to all of you on, uh, on the design parameters and on the description uh, and, and I will show you the reality of what these speakers can do because there's a lot of reviews coming out on this uh, loudspeaker and uh, people generally tend to like it a lot and I think uh, at this price range uh, this is something truly wonderful we don't really see many uh, good speakers in this range so this is a kind of a refreshment a very nice thing to see but let's just see like uh, the promises, how much of these promises uh, is uh, translated to real life experience. Because here we have uh, uh, some of these uh, things that, that make it a little hard to believe. Um, one of them is the sensitivity is listed at 96 dB and the impedance at 8 ohms and frequency response down to 45 hertz with a minus 3 dB point. And now the size is this, basically 8 inch wide, uh, almost 16 inch high and almost 12 inch deep. So that's something like um, about 15 to 18 liters free air volume. That, that's really, really tiny. And uh, if, if we are talking about uh, efficiency and base response, uh, they need to be, uh, they require large cabinets. So now I just show you this thing. 
this is the trinity of loudspeaker design physics. And there are three parts to it. Uh, low frequency extension, high efficiency, and small size. So if you build any loudspeaker only, you can have only two of these. You can have deep bass and small size, but then efficiency will be low. You can have high efficiency, small size, but then you won't have bass. Or you can have bass and high efficiency, but then it will be a huge loudspeaker. So, so there we go. Uh, if we have uh, like a small size cabinet and, and of course si small size cabinet is mandatory for, uh, for a, a low price point because if we go for a bigger cabinet then uh, it will be very expensive and not just because we need more material to make the cabinet but also because uh, the the shipping costs and the sh storage costs so everything that we are uh, ensure that you get your speaker from the manufacturer to your house all of those charges that are, so are associated with moving and storing your loudspeakers are much much higher and when we are talking about uh, lower cost uh, loudspeakers then that cost of getting it to you and then storing it in a warehouse and then a retail store and then at uh, the place where you buy it uh, that adds up to quite a lot of money in the, in the final account so if you want to uh, increase the bass response because you know that most of the small size speakers they really are just good down to maybe 50 hertz, 45 hertz, but not lower. If we want to push it like 40 hertz or 35 hertz, we need a much bigger cabinet. And even if we just want to go, let's say, from 50 hertz to 40 hertz, then you need a twice as big cabinet to have the same efficiency. If you want to uh, keep the same cabinet size but go lower in frequency, then you will take a serious dive in efficiency. So, for example, if you had a 90 dB efficient uh, bookshelf speaker that goes down to uh, 50 Hz, if you want to make it go down to 40 Hz and keep the same size, then you are go dropping down the efficiency to about uh, less than uh, around 82 dB. Uh, yep, that much. So, so cabinet size is king uh, when we are talking about efficiency and frequency, low frequency. Sim and this is physics. That's because low frequency sound waves are very long and they, uh, to reproduce them correctly, you need that big cabinet size. The same thing with efficiency. Uh, when, when you have a small size cabinet, then the air behind the driver is highly pressurized compared to the air in your room. And that highly pressurized air holds back the membrane. This is the easiest explanation. This is oversimplified explanation, but that's the gist of it. And, and if you want higher efficiency, then uh, you need a bigger cabinet volume because when your driver cone moves, then the pressure change when, when behind the ca inside the cabinet, when it moves out, it's much smaller compared to a small box, and that's why you can get higher efficiency. <sighs> so, so that's about it. And now let's go back to here and uh, let's take uh, a peek at the Stereophile's website because uh, they have uh, reviewed the, the RP600M and they have done measurements on it. And the measurements, they will tell you, they vo will not tell you whether you will like the sound or not, but they will tell us a lot about it. And there is like a lot of uh, blah, blah. We will skip that through because instead of the, of uh, John Atkinson, I think it was John Atkinson who did it. 
What is it him? It should be him. Uh, I'm just curious. Sorry, guys. I'm just scroll. Oh, oh, oh. Yep, John Atkinson, of course. <laughs> he does all the stereo file measurement. I'm just hoping that he's still there. Okay, where was I? Ah, uh, let's go here. The impedance curve. So what does that curve tell us? You remember when we were here and it said about the impedance? It's not truly 8 ohms. It just says 8 ohms compatible. Is it now truly 8 ohms compatible? Let's look at where it dips. You see it dips there. Let's read it. It's 3 point something ohms. It's not even 4 ohms. So I would say yeah it can be 8 ohm compatible but this is a 4 ohm driver i mean 4 ohm loudspeaker so <laughs> which is like partially compatible to 8 ohm this is kind of like saying uh, like a two cylinder car which is a four cylinder compatible <laughs> so like you can put this engine into a, a car that uses four cylinders like duh no it, it's a four ohm speaker okay uh, if you have an 8 ohm impedance amp, will it play with that? Yeah, it will play. But if you have an amp that can drive 4 ohm load and that has a 4 ohm tap on your loudspeaker, then at this point, this speaker will sound the way it is intended to sound. If you put it on the 8 ohm tap or your amp can only drive 8 ohm, it's not happy with 4 ohm, it will not be happy with the clips. Uh, Although to what degree, it depends on the amp, it depends on your listening preferences. So I will not say that if you have an 8 ohm amp, you cannot buy the speaker, that's that wrong. You can try it out, but you will go much better, you will fare way better if your own amp is 4 ohm uh, capable and if your tube amp has a 4 ohm tap. So make sure if you have a tube amp, put it on the 4 ohm tap, otherwise the bass will be uh, out of control. Okay, so, so looking at the impedance curve, there's two more things. So here you see this is what the tweeter does, which is a horn-loaded tweeter. So as you see, as we go through the crossover, uh, the impedance rises. Why, why or not? Mm, that's not for today. But uh, after the crossover is done, then this is uh, the main... Uh, this is the strength of the tweeter and you see it's like in the like 6 to 11 or 15 kilohertz range 6 to 15 kilohertz range that's where it is the strongest and there the impedance is above 14 ohms so it means that uh, because the impedance is so high in the high frequencies the highs will be very clear and uh, distortion free because when you are reflecting such high impedance to your amplifier, then uh, the higher the impedance, the less the amplifier distorts. And, and now we are going like 14 ohms is like almost four times the actual impedance of the driver. You see, we are from three ohms basically jumping to 14, like three times four, 12. So it's basically five times uh, higher impedance than the impedance of the driver i mean speaker sorry this means that when it's on the 4 ohm tap the cleans will be v i mean the highs will be very very clean and uh, and i think probably that's that's part of what uh, draws people in about the speaker that the the high frequencies must be uh, pretty good and uh, also when we look at the, the horn to it, that there is a horn attached to the high frequencies. So there you see the, the, the driver and, the, and this thing here, that's the horn, that's the Tactrix horn that's attached to it. And, uh, and as you see, it's not, not a simple Tactrix horn, it's, it's one of Klipsch's more modern designs. So they are trickling down their technology from their higher-end models into this model. So that's not that usual junk uh, uh, primitive horn that you see in small speakers. This is something much more elaborate. And, uh, and what this does is basically when, when the tweeter is making the sound, 
that sound if the tweeter was not horn loaded it's in the front of the driver most of the sound gets lost on the side just push, just it explodes into space but when you have a horn in front then the sound just starts like uh, the pressure wave starts to increase increase and spread out so so the spreading of the pressure wave is controlled and that's why uh it will be transmitted much more effectively into the room versus just just blowing up on the front of the loudspeaker and and that's what adds a, a tremendous boost to the efficiency of the tweeter and uh, as a result uh, it is much more efficient than uh, a regular tweeter however here is the thing so when we are talking about horn speakers if you have a horn tweeter uh, then that's not the limit to the efficiency uh, we can put like uh, in this position a tweeter that's like 110 db efficient but uh, but then the question is uh, can the woofer keep up and the answer is a hard no. The woofer can not keep up. So in the same thing here, the woofer's efficiency is way, way, way below the the horn horn's efficiency. It cannot keep up. So what Klipsch needs to do is to drop the sensitivity of the horn of the tweeter by quite a lot. To match it to the low efficiency of the woofer because the only way to make the woofer as efficient as the tweeter is to have a cabinet not of that uh, tiny size but a cabinet this size that baby that's the size of a refrigerator so if you have a refrigerator then you will be able to enjoy a horn's uh, efficiency if not, what you need to do is drop it. How? And then, then people would say, okay, now uh, screw it, we, we lost it all. No, you have not lost it because uh, uh, for, the sm for these small box, uh, bookshelf speakers, uh, the limitation is not just in the bass, it's also in the high frequencies. And especially the dome tweeters, they, uh, they cannot handle loud sound sound levels without distorting really heavily and if we add a horn in front of that tweeter even though we have to drop down its efficiency they probably need to drop at least 6 to 10 db from the efficiency by adding extra resistors to the crossover network inside but it means that now when the music signal is pumping at 10 watts into this loudspeaker then the burden on the tweeter is only one watt so it's just ticking at 10 percent of the demand so basically you are getting a plus 10 db headroom for the high frequencies and uh, so when we go back to Stereophile. Now we have two advantages for the high frequencies. One of them is the super high impedance, which means the ultra low distortion from the amplifier. And the second thing is that uh, uh, the uh, tweeter itself is working at 10% of its rated capacity and has basically 10 times greater headroom than any other loudspeaker which is not horn loaded so that's why although these are pretty small bookshelf speakers i'm pretty sure that if you crank up the volume the high frequencies will remain clear and undistorted even to quite loud volumes of course the woofer will uh, give up the ghost at uh, very high volumes but the greatest limitation uh, with the uh, solid state amplifiers is the tweeter is the high frequencies because solid state amps uh, when they distort because we are asking them to uh, either to be to play loud or 
to uh, reproduce high energy, high frequency transient, which is in the case of piano, violin, harp, guitar. And for these instruments, uh, let's say for the violin or piano, even if you listen to them at a low volume, your tweeter and your amplifier and your solid state amp are already distorting quite a bit. So giving you this advantage, I make that prediction that this very uh, budget uh, loudspeaker will uh, provide high frequencies and uh, much better than even some loudspeakers at 10 times its price. And that's, simple, that's simply because uh, it has the horn design, which gives that extra efficiency. It is like having 10 of the, the same tweeter doing his job. It's giving you that much extra as if ha literally having 10 tweeters. But of course, if you have 10 tweeters, that gives a tremendous smear. So in real life, uh, just increasing the number of tweeters doesn't work. The only thing you can do to increase the tweeters' uh, uh, effectiveness is to put a horn in front of it, horn load it, and then you will have a range of frequencies where it will be uh, coupling to the room. It will be able to communicate its energy to the room much better. And I really welcome this approach because whenever you solve a, a, a loudspeaker problem by using acoustics to make it work with your room, it is much, much better than trying to solve it at the crossover level and trying to uh, just uh, muscle it into your room. That doesn't work. It's like dancing. If you make the leader a more competent dancer, then the lady will have a much better experience. If you give steroids to the leader and you gave a straight jacket on the lady, it, uh, uh, yeah, he can drag the lady around, he can uh, slam the lady into the ceiling and, and just throw her out from the dance park at bed. But that's not dancing. That has nothing to do with dancing. So now we are hitting a very long time. So I am stopping now and continuing from here in the second part. Thank you, Adam, for asking the question. And I will continue this long response that's turning into a saga. But uh, I hope it's, it's really informative. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, tell your friends. Bye-bye.